As always, our show is sponsored by Memoria Press. You can find our curriculum at memoriapress.com. Welcome to Classical Etc., a show from Memoria Press that dives into the philosophy, culture, and heart of classical education. You're in the studio with Shane Saxon. Welcome to another episode of Classical Etc. I'm seated with some of my friends, Ian, Mitch, and Lee. Now, before we get into our episode where we talk about the silver chair, let me ask you guys, Lee, what have you been reading recently? <laughs> <laughs> We're laughing because I just confessed that I'm not reading anything new. I'm still <laughs> reading Lassie with Tanya, mm-hmm. and I'm still reading um, My Antonia by Willa Cather. Um, I've and so I love it. It's great, but I um, am slow going. <laughs> I, I'm afraid of putting people on the spot when they come to the podcast. It's like, it's okay if you're reading two books and have five kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Um, Mitch, what about you? Um, in the middle of um, uh, The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco. Okay. So I read Laris, which is like the Eastern response mm-hmm. to the name of the rose. And you're supposed to have read that first. Okay. So you could recognize the response and I didn't do that. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm so in typical fashion. You're yeah. doing the I'm first doing part. The way I'd like to do it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, or the way that it just, I stumbled upon it. <laughs> yes. Uh, so yeah, I'm in the middle of that. Okay. Ian, what about you? Uh, yeah. So reading through Don Quixote because that is taking a lot of time to work through and you uh, may never finish. I may never, fin- <laughs> no, I will finish. I will try to finish. I picked up uh, the little novella by Tolstoy, uh, the death of, I always say Ivan Ilyich and uh, it's great. Little, I, I've only read like half of it, which is silly because it's like 45 pages long, but you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll finish that too at some point. I started reading a book this morning uh, called a brief history of the record of timekeeping. It's a little <laughs> I have a professor at Union <laughs> college in New York. Um, One of those and, books of information. I know you are Eustace. I, <laughs> <laughs> perhaps, but it's actually really interesting. If you've ever thought about defining time, what time is, and that's what the first chapter is about. I don't know. The person who got me <laughs> thinking about it was Neil Postman in his book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. In his first chapter, he's kind of illustrating the medium is the message, and he talks about the medium of clocks and how they shift our perception of time. And that's that's always kind of been in the back of my head when I saw, when I saw this book available on my library app. I was like, oh, that, that seems All interesting. Right, right. So, would recommend. I'm only a chapter <laughs> in. <laughs> now, even better than a brief history of, t- of timekeeping is the silver chair, the book we're discussing today. And this is probably a less well-known book in the Chronicles of Narnia series in terms of the plot. So Ian, could you just tell a listener who maybe isn't familiar or hasn't read it in a long time, just a brief summary of what happens in this book. It's one of three, I believe that doesn't feature any of the Pevensey children. Um, That's right. What happens in the silver chair? Yeah. So in brief, you start with Eustace and Jill and they're at experiment house in the first. And this Eustace, this is Eustace. This is Eustace from the voyage of the Dawn Treader. So Mm -hmm. it's the second time into Narnia. He's now become a commonplace boy. That's right. That's (laughs) That's right. right. (laughs) And and Lewis even says, you know, his name is Eustace Scrub, but he's not that bad. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. He's sort of a good chap or something like that. (laughs) Anyway, they're at experiment house, which is uh, obviously a very progressive school. And uh, Lewis has a lot to say about that, but Jill is crying behind the gym. Eustace comes and comforts her and starts to tell her about Narnia. And of course, through a series of events, they end up in Narnia first on uh, the mountain of Aslan. And then Jill makes a mistake. Eustace falls off this massive cliff. He's blown to Narnia. Jill is given a task. She's told by Aslan, you know, you're here to save a prince. And here are four signs that will guide you to do that. And the four signs are first, the first person that used to seize is an old friend. He needs to go up and speak to him. Then you need to go on a journey to a northern mountain, to a northern uh, giant city, a, a ruined giant city. That third within that city, there's going to be a message written. You need to read it. You need to follow it. And that finally, the... Uh, only person who uh, I think I'm saying this correctly, the only person who calls my name or uh, something like that uh, is the person you're trying to rescue. Well, over the course of the novel, they they muff the first three signs. They they start the journey. They they get to, they they when they both arrive in Narnia, they they miss meeting uh, the old King Caspian as he's as he's boarding a ship to go sail again to try to find his lost son. They hear the story of the lost prince. Basically, the prince and his mother had gone out maying, and his mother dies by. Uh, by a poisonous serpent bite. And so the prince then goes to try to uh, avenge his mother, but ends up being enchanted by an enchantress Mm -hmm. and, and being lost. And so, 
uh, Jill and Eustace, they, they, um, are helped by a series of uh, Narnian creatures, eventually a Marsh Wiggle named Puddle Glum, who helps them go north to find this city. They uh, they meet this enchantress. They don't quite know it yet, but they they meet her. They're, they're somewhat enchanted by her. They forget the signs. They end up in a giant city where they're in danger. They have to escape. Only then do they finally realize, oh, there is a, there's a message out there. There's, a, there's an old ruined city that we passed that we didn't realize, and they had to be far away enough to see the message. They find the message under me. They go under. They come into the world of underworld. And there they find the prince. Now, I don't want to give everything away. Let's let's maybe oh, get into sure. it from there. Uh, but that's the gist of it. But they there's a, a, journey a descent the into prince. hell is involved. The, a descent. They start again on that mountain of Aslan and they descend from there. This is when you say, and if they rescue Prince Rillian, you'll have to read to find out. You'll have to read to find out. That's right. <laughs> so Mitch, I want to shift over to you and ask an important part of this novel are these four signs mm. that are given to the children. What do you think Lewis is teaching readers with these four signs? Lee, before we were sitting down here, was talking about how to really read these novels well. You kind of have to get beyond the, just the story that Ian just told to what Lewis is doing mm. and the theology, the mm. philosophy he's teaching. So what, what are these yeah. four signs doing? I've really struggled with this and I kind of go back and forth because he calls them signs, but yet they're instructions. Mm -hmm. So typically, so when we think of signs, we think of like maybe something that's sacramental, something that is a symbol, uh, a symbol that like represents something else, but these aren't really representing something else. They're pure descriptions. They're like, they're, they're more uh, analogous to like the Bible mm -hmm. than to some like the Eucharist or, or you know, or baptism. Um, so there's an instructive element to it. There's something they're supposed to sort of call to mind. I'm just thinking of, you know, those Old Testament passages of, you know, you're always remember memory is a really important yes. role, right? And also in the allegory of the cave, right? In, in Plato's Republic, memory is is very important. Um, and so there, there are these, it seems to me that even though he calls them signs, they are these um, sort of, I think he's sort of symbolically tried gesturing towards that, importance of of truth that is defined from a, a divine being that we have to call into mind that are that's going to sort of guide us direct us give us life in a holistic sense not just a um here you know like if we define it as like you do x in y situation or whatever no it's sort of sort of a holistic set of the their instructions designed to get you through the whole journey mm. right mm. so i don't know um those are my thoughts but i i think I'm a little confused, not confused, but I, I'm still like sort of playing with the symbol. It's a sign, but it's also instructions. So I don't know. Did, yeah. Any further clarification that you'd give her? I mean, one of the things that I noticed in like a recent rereading of this, because it, the, these are difficult. I think, <clears throat> I think Lewis and a lot of his language allows signs and symbols to have a lot of different things mm. going on inside them. So when Jill first meets Aslan on the Mount of Aslan and um, she's given the task. Aslan says, I give you a command or I lay this command on you uh, that you will search for the prince, either finding him dying in the attempt or, yes. you know, getting back to your own world. So that's the command. And uh, we've, we've discussed in a, in a previous book club, how these, these signs, maybe they're like scripture, maybe they're, you know, maybe that's what it's representing. And I think there may be some truth to that, um, but the command, the thing that they have to follow is, is the journey, uh, the finding of the mm -hmm. prince. And then Aslan goes on to say that these signs will guide you. And I think that that's sort of the key, the key phrase there that whatever they represent, they are a guiding principle that they're not necessarily something that has to be followed in order that in order to, to make the journey work, to, to, to satisfy the demands of Aslan, but that in the best world, they are the things that you follow to do that. I don't know if that's clarified yeah. it any and, further. And Lee, you've made a couple of comments about Lewis's portrayal of the journey, right. even in the silver chair. Right. Well, and I think, you know, the, the signs are also helps. I mean, yeah. you know, they say, you know, used to say hello to a friend and that's going to help you. And, you know, I think that it's interesting in all of Narnia that, um, that Lewis, every book is about this journey, mm -hmm. um, but Lewis does not romanticize the journey mm -hmm. at all. I mean, he is, um, you know, he's uh, very explicit about, 
you know, the physical hardships of the journey and the inconveniences and the struggles and the discomfort um, and the pain um, and the sacrifice that's required of these journeys and and um, in all of in all of Narnia. And I think that that's really interesting because, um, you know, of course, Chesterton was a huge influence on Lewis and Chesterton says of education and of, you know, of life that, you know, everything needs to point to one single end and everything has to support that end or it's not education at all, or it's not really a philosophy of life of living at all. And I think Lewis does such a good job of, of um, you know, collecting all the small details in a truth that points to a single mm-hmm. worldview um, a, about the world and about this journey toward heaven and the reality of that journey, which um, requires a heroic effort, but it's not comfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So it seems like there are a number of different vignettes maybe in this novel that have various aspects of that teaching embedded in them. And so maybe we could work through those vignettes and talk about what is highlighted. So maybe we could start with the giant hall. What do you think Lewis is getting at when Jill and Eustace think that they've come to this great place and they're being taken care of, but they're actually what's on the menu menu for dinner <laughs> uh, at, the, at the feast? What, what is the symbolism there? What is Lewis trying to teach us? Well, we probably need to step back because they, the reason they got there is because they were lied to. That's right. Uh, right. They were sort of told that they were, this is going to be an inviting place. Right. Mm-hmm. So they, they trusted the wrong authority. That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, and so when they got there, they couldn't see past what they had been, what the lie that they had believed. Right. And so I think one important theme here that probably goes all the way back to the description of the, of the school as experiment house um, is that there's, which is supposed to be a trusted authority that kids, you know, could go to school and listen to. Right. Um, If you listen to the wrong authority, if you believe the wrong authority, um, then truth, you you may, uh, you truth may be hidden from you. Mm. Mm. Um, And there may be disastrous consequences like being eaten. (laughs) Sure. Well, and and they were tempted. I mean, in, in all, in, in this book, you know, um, they were, they are tempted by false beauty, right? I mm-hmm. mean, they were tempted by um, this lovely woman, you know, with this mm-hmm. beautiful voice that sounded like a song. And they were lured by um, the, uh, the appeal of a warm meal and a warm fire. And they mm-hmm. were cold and, you know, clothes and a real bed and, you know, these kinds of things. And they were, they were tempted with false beauty um, and, and, you know, the promise of these worldly comforts. And that's what we see in all of, you know, throughout the entire book is just, um, and, you know, we see it in all of Narnia. I mean, you know, you think of the magician just swooning over the beauty of, you know, Jadis. And, you know, Lewis gives us these, ideas over and over and over again so we don't miss them right. you know but it's it, it's they're being tempted by the worldly comforts and the mm. worldly material things over and over and over again and that's where they always go astray right the turkish delight <laughs> right, you know, right, right. Just, well and those worldly delights totally push out the memory of the signs mm. i mean it's clear in that section that jill and eustace i think lewis even says they forget about the signs mm. you know those comforts take first first place um which, which Lewis actually says in, I, I think, Mere Christianity, but I mean, there's a great passage that he says, you know, uh, just a prosperity knits a man to the world. And mm. just when mm-hmm. he thinks he's making his place in the world, the world is actually making its place in him. Mm. And so the more comfortable we get, um, and I think Lewis, you know, talks about, you know, you know, prosperity and stature and, you know, all of the things that the world can promise you, you're actually... You're, you know, the world is making its place in you and mm-hmm. you are mm-hmm. becoming knitted to the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, it, it, I, and then also personally, I mean, we're, we're sort of sold the lie that uh, discomfort is the greatest problem you, you need to solve mm-hmm. in, in your life today. And so that affects education, right? We shouldn't make kids memorize. We, we shouldn't give them too much homework, you mm-hmm. know, we, and, and because we're kind of sold this lie that, that the greatest problem that you need to solve on earth is actually discomfort. And, um, and the, what's helpful about the, 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 all these stories, especially this one, um, is the role that discomfort plays in them getting there and then becoming the right, the, the person That's that right. they right. needed to be, right? right. They had right. to go through that. It, right. was, it was vitally important that they experienced that discomfort so that they would miss the sign, so that they would learn to see the final sign. That's right. Right. right when it finally got there. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just reminded of, uh, of you know, in, in our personal lives, there's so many ways where we can try to solve the uh, immediate discomfort of the situation 
um, you know, everything from serving your family to, um, you know, or, you know, specifically like in my relationship with my wife, right. There's shortcuts that you could take, but actually, you know, going to you know, serving her and, and like getting the energy up to do that is I joked earlier about doing the dishes, um, <laughs> which is a dear burden to me. Um, <laughs> no, just kidding. Actually, no, not kidding. It's, it's real. Um, yeah. Well, that, that's just, I'm some, yeah. Well, you have five kids. I have one kid and she hardly uses any dishes. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this other than to say that, uh, um, it's, it's vitally important to take up, uh, take up arms against those sea of troubles, uh, because they play a formative role, uh, in your life. Well, and it's, and it's, and it, and it's, and it really, that point is basically that that's where you, that's the fork in the road, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, are you seeking these material comforts and yeah. these material things, or are you seeking, you know, something that can't even be a change be achieved here? And that, you know, Lewis in mere Christianity says, you know, we're, we're not, we either we're, we're like eggs, right? We yeah. have to hatch or go bad. So the journey is either about, mm collecting these worldly things or just simply becoming a changed person, which requires these difficult experiences. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, it's completely you know, opposite directions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When they're going to move in those opposite directions, they encounter this enchantress who is dressed in green. Lee, what's the significance of that color <laughs> to you? And what is, how does it illustrate this point that you're making? Well, you guys all know around the table that I love the minutia of stories. And I think that, you know, that, that to you me, that's green today. I did. I did. Wow. Maybe, who knows? <laughs> yes. maybe. Um, but um, I, you know, I think that the small details, I just think that that's just such a brilliant stroke on behalf of um, these authors. I think that's what's so appealing about mm -hmm. them. And I think, you know, choosing a certain number of, you know, for certain things to happen or colors, um, you know, just these small details. And I think, you know, when we see that the witch, you know, she exudes this green light and, you know, the serpent is this green serpent in which, you know, is a symbolic of envy and she mm. is representative of pride, right? I mean, mm. she wants, um, I mean, she wants total control of everything and she wants everyone to submit to her um, authority and her tyranny. And she, um, you know, so I think that that color, um, you know, I think Lewis gives us those kinds of clues all the way throughout mm. in those small details. And again, you know, Lewis, I think, understands that everything, you know, sort of corroborates together to get to a single worldview. And all those tiny details, when authors do that well, I just think that that's, you know, another clue that we can mm. pick up on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's move backwards before we move forwards. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch, another vignette that I think is interesting that you you talked about in the book book discussion a lot is when uh, Eustace goes over the side of the cliff. What's the significance of that vignette in the story? Yeah, it strikes me that he gets to um, you know he's at the mountaintop, right, and that's a significant right. That's the highest point in Narnia, you know, and in the, it's a well kept garden, mm -hmm. right? The trees are 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 there's grass growing underneath them. If you know anything about um, forestry, and I know a little because of this book I read about Norwegian wood, um, <laughs> um, uh, that is uh, symbolic of a very well-kept, mm -hmm. luxurious um, forest, right? So all the underbrush is cut down, the branches are cut all the way, it takes a lot of time, money, right? So that's a symbol of of order, right? Of, of a place that is idyllic in a lot of ways. Um, but then there's this fall, caused by Jill. <laughs> um, and, the, and then that's when their, their journey begins, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever. So I, I think I, when I'm reading that, I'm thinking this feels to me like the fall of Adam and Eve a bit, a literal mm -hmm. fall, uh, which has been on the nose, but, um, <laughs> but it, but it, I, I, yeah, I think it's there. Cause that as soon as they fall, then their task, right. He speaks to Jill and he charges her. And what is, um, what does God do with, with uh, Eve mm -hmm. whenever uh, after the fall, you know, he whispers a promise to her um, and, and charges her as well. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe, maybe I'm reading too much into it, but. No, I think that that, I mean, that, I, I think that's water, but also, you know, a, a, the idea of fear. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. cliffs are uh, Eustace's just great number one fear. fear. There yeah. is great fear, mm -hmm. right? And then dark cavernous spots are Jill's <laughs> great fear, right? And throughout the story, we see these children like just, no choice, but you have to absolutely face your fear and you have to have faith, you know, beyond mm -hmm. your fear. And several times in the story, you know, Puddleglum, the great hero of the story, you know, says, you know, at, at this point in the journey, just, you know, 
fear and even courage don't matter at all. You have to, you know, honor and reason, you know, is what counts here and faith as well. And so, you know, I think Lewis is pointing to this fact of we can't follow our feelings. I mean, the feelings at this, at this point, feelings are nothing right mm-hmm. now. It's duty and, and honor and faith and reason. And so you just have to let go of those things. And the fact that he points out that this fear is present and that it absolutely must be faced mm-hmm. um, in the story, I think says something about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So you there's mentioned- a stream at the beginning. I mean, <laughs> right. Yeah. It, right. Like a river flowing out of the garden. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There's a river flowing out of a garden and uh, there's something about that stream that is, uh, that draws you to it, mm-hmm. right? It, 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 and it, it, there's something that is refreshing about that stream. You know, Jill looks at the stream and she's never been thirstier before, mm-hmm. right? And but and she also knows deep down that that, that if she just had one sip, that would that would satisfy. That, that would satisfy her, you know. So I mean, we can't get more biblical. And then Aslan standing on the other side of the stream, like the woman at the well, right? And he's like, "Well, don't you? I mean, if you knew the person you're asking." Uh, you know, then you would know that I could give you life and give it to you abundantly. Uh, so yeah, I, I think there's a lot there about Jesus, about uh, that thirst that doesn't satisfy, and also about about truth being this this thing that flows ultimately from from Aslan, right? Yeah. He's the trusted authority, right? And he doesn't let Jill drink without him. She asks if he will go away, and he doesn't let her. Yeah, he says you have to you have to have me here. You've got to let me stay here while you drink. And I think there's such good biblical. Yeah. Yeah. John it's rich, imagery. Yeah, yeah. Rich, rich imagery. So Lee, you mentioned Puddle Glum. He's a significant oh, character in this novel. Right. He's kind of the reaper cheap of silver right, chair. Right. <laughs> the right. Reaper, yeah. yeah. What do you all make of this marsh wiggle who does apparently doesn't taste good according to the giants? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I love him. I think he's one of the best characters that, that, that Lewis comes up with just the, I mean, he's so likable, just the, the gloom, the doom, well, he's the and most the optimistic joy. of all that's the right. Yeah. Of all the that's puzzles, right. of all the, uh, the marsh yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, I'll let others <laughs> talk, talk about right. him, but I just wanted to say he's just a great figure. He's really well formed, um, you know, and he's also kind of, at, I mean, he's most often at times, he's the one that recognizes, he's always the one, I should say, that recognizes the enchantment, that recognizes the false nature, mm-hmm. the untruth that the the enchantress or the giants are presenting as the truth. So he is sort of the outside, you know, uh, gracious figure who who provides clarity and unclarity, mm. even if they don't listen to him. <laughs> and you know, I love it that I love it that he's you know kind of sour and glum and really sort of cynical in yeah. certain ways, and yet so heroic in the in That's other right. ways. I mean, you know, I think that you know. When we were talking about this before, I said saints come in all forms, you know, and I think that that's the, I mean, I think that that's what Puddle Glum shows us is mm-hmm. that, you know, um, it, 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 we, we, we're all called to be saints, right? And so saints are as individual as, you know, every person, right? Mm-hmm. And so I think that Puddle Glum's personality um, is, is great because, again, Lewis isn't romanticizing, uh, you know, what, what's happening here. He's saying yeah. we, can, we can kind of be. <laughs> yeah and speaking of heroic i mean when the final scene not the final scene but towards, oh, you're, you're jumping ahead uh, okay, jumping okay ahead. sorry sorry yeah, sorry. Not, that's on me just, yeah. so let's just, let's go you there brought in a character let's descend so, into the underworld okay so that's the next vignette i think we yeah. should talk about you mentioned just a minute ago mitch that this story starts you know after they leave the experiment house on a high mountain yeah and then it it descends slowly through the story down into the underworld and they're there because they're trying to find prince Rillian. This is a rich text and the most rich part of this text is when they're in the underworld. What do you make of this scene? What's the significance of the enchantress and what she's done to really explore those ideas? Yeah. Where to start? I mean, the whole idea of going into a place where, um, you know, they pass father time Mm -hmm. yeah, sleeping on their way in. Right. And, uh, so almost like time stops, Time and space are hard to really figure out down here. That's right. uh, you know, time, time, maybe there's more to Father Time. It's such a weird decision. Someone mentioned, I think, in our book <laughs> discussion that there's the legend of Father Time waking up and it being the end of the world. So I think that that's kind of foreshadowing the last battle. Yeah. And I think it's just drawing from some of the like European traditions of the king under the mountain. You know, there's this idea that King Arthur's coming back or Merlin's asleep under the mountain. I think even Charlemagne has a, there's right. a king under the mountain myth with Charlemagne. So. 
Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, all all those things are probably there, especially in the last battle. I always forget yes. about the last yeah. battle, but um, no spoilers. Um, <clears throat> but the idea of going into an underworld where I, I don't know how far to get into this, right? Without uh, you know, but let's I, get into I, it. Go all the way in. I mean, at the end of the day, what they're confronting there is uh, is is this underworld the true depiction of reality, mm-hmm. right? Because that's you know they 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 get down there, they they finally they're they're told the lie, they're beginning to believe a lie, um, and 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 then they find the key, the the prince, and. Um, and before they can escape, the the witch cast a spell on them, um, and they're confused about what is true, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe the underworld is maybe there's no such thing as the sun. Mm. Can you believe such a preposterous thing? That's like right. there, there's this ball of fire up there, we would all die, right? So there is no such thing. They're they're beginning to believe this lie, this in, through this enchantment of of the re, the reality that we knew out there in Narnia doesn't really exist. The only reality is what's here. Mm. And, and, and we're, we're, we're just that that's all a lie. Like that's the fake world out there. Um, and which is a central theme of the story. Where is who defines truth? Where does truth come from? Mm-hmm. Um, and what is it attractive? Like, are you going to, are, are you going to listen to that? Right. And the queen is so manipulative with language. Mm, I right. mean, that's one of the, you know, that's, that's the way that she um, distorts the reality for, the prince and for mm-hmm. Eustace and Jill, um, you know, she, you know, she, she tells the prince, Oh, well for a moment, you know, she, she, she compl- she offers a complete inversion of reality every time in her um, attempt to um, confuse the children. And so she's misusing language itself mm-hmm. um, as, as her first uh, sort of, um, way to pierce through reality, and mm-hmm. you know we, you know we, t- oh, you're lying. Well, you're lying. Isn't it really just a cat? Mm-hmm. And isn't your son just, you know, I mean, a lamp? And so she's using comparative things and um, metaphors. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because that's what language is. <laughs> language is just metaphor, right? That, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, to um, to to distort that reality, and I think you know that's such a great thing to be aware. And it's interesting to think a little deep, like think a little bit, dwell a bit longer on what she's doing, right? Because you think about all the things that you feel um, that come that are conjured in the mind when you think of a lion, you know, scary, right. fearful, ma- almost ma- majestic, yes. but right. in a scary no, right, way. Right, and she's right, and, and then she's diluting says, it to yeah, this weakness a of a cat, right? Right. And when you think of a cat, you think right. of none of those things. They're like kind of annoying, right? You know, like, <laughs> Yeah. Like, yeah. wow, just yeah. the mystery and awe of that thing. And so by by changing her description of it, she she lowers it. She does not give to it the esteem that it should. That's right. 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 Whereas Lewis, when he's talking about Aslan with you know truth and objectivity, he says things about Aslan like his mane was almost like a judge's wig. Yeah. Right. I mean, <laughs> and so, you know, he gives he gives a complete opposite description, but it's but it's it's purely the use of words that are giving, you know, your um sort of impetus toward what what you see as reality. It reminds me of in Dr. Bloom's introduction to Nature's Beautiful Order, which is a book <clears throat> that we have in Memorial Press that our students read. Um, he he's talking about kind of progressive modes of teaching science versus a more classical tradition of teaching science that in the more progressive modes, they'll focus on the discrete parts of animals and talk about the lungs and they break it down. And well, actually these animals are made up of whereas, little bits. Yeah. This, mm-hmm. stu- this study is about the animal and about right. what's beautiful about it. And the, and the enchantress is doing something similar. She's saying, well, it's actually just this, and it's just distorting their perception by kind of well actually everyone back right, behind, right, right. behind reality. Yeah. And that's what, you know, and that's what Eustace did. Remember in the voyage of the Dawn Treader, you know, Jill had this just whole idea of um, miracle and fantasy and metaphysical things and otherworldly ideas that, you know, were, were believable and real and true. And Eustace did the exact same thing when he so ex- he explained everything away. Mm, you know, he right. he just took everything down to its material, you know, understanding and explained away the miracle and the and, uh, of life, basically, mm, and mm. everything that he looked at until he had his conversion. Yeah. <laughs> what do you all make of the silver chair? Mm. No, that's a tough one. Because I mean, I guess in some ways it's not tough because it seems just like a clear reference. Um, 
that supports my thesis. Uh, <laughs> that, that, um, so actually, it's very significant um, that this book is more like the the Odyssey than the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Um, you say that because the chair at Circe's table that Odysseus gets bewitched in is silver. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think that's just a like a very clear a very clear reference. There's a descent into the into the underworld, right? There's this returning back home and having to get, and have to sort of get the house in order, right? There's and that's when Prince Caspian actually, after he's died, he comes back he to experiment house to take care of the bullies, similar to the way Odysseus deals with the suitors. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, I, and yeah, there's so much, and there's this long journey, and there's things that you have to remember. You have to call them. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, this book, I think there's a, there's a lot more echo, I think, in this than there is in the Voyage in the John Shredder, even though on the nose of it. Um, uh, like a boat sure. traveling to different sure. islands <laughs> <laughs> seems to be, you know, more, um, uh, but that'd be a bad take. Well, and this, this book also, <laughs> to me, there's a lot of princess and the goblin in this book too. And, you know, Lewis was influenced by McDonald too, but you get, you, there's a lot of similarity, um, in this book and princess and the goblin, but something that I think is really interesting about, um, the silver chair. Um, I, I think that feet are particularly interesting mm. and i think that lewis uses the use in the language of feet he does mitchell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some people's feet are really interesting <laughs> but for instance you know the the gnomes in this book you know they just he constantly talking about them paddling padding along yeah. softly yeah. and they have soft feet well the goblins and the princess and the goblin also have soft feet and you know the gnomes are um th there is uh, uh oh they're as busy as they are sad they're just mm. you know they're they're just um, marching along on this, you, you know, pragmatic sort of workaday busyness that's not accomplishing anything, and it's just making them sad. And um, and you know, Lewis talks about like soft feet he, in in Narnia in uh, Wild Land, which in the wardrobe when the snow is melting. You know, there's a there's a scene where um, the snow is melting and the um, the feet melt first in um, Lucy. Is talking to Aslan, she says, well, he's not melting entirely. It's just the feet. And Aslan says, it's okay. When the feet are put right, the rest will follow. Mm -hmm. And so this importance of the feet being firm and solid and being a solid foundation for you and headed in the right direction. So I think, you know, these details about soft feet that are, you know, not where they're supposed to be and not offering you the solid foundation that you're supposed to have. I mean, I think these details are, <laughs> are important. And it, it made me think a lot about princess and the goblin and, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and setting your feet in the right direction. That's right. right. Yeah. Well, and, and you see that they're that way because of the enchantress. Right. Mm -hmm. She's right. enchanted them. And so you see the reverse of that when, when uh, Rillian finally defeats the enchantress, joy breaks forth throughout the underworld. Mm. A great chasm opens up. And, you know, we, we've talked about the descent from, from the Mount of Aslan down through Narnia, down into the underworld. But what's interesting is that takes a little bit of a turn here because a chasm opens up within underworld and the gnomes descend even, even further. But in their case, it's right. It's good. Right. I mean, down there, there's actually live gold, live silver, live right. diamonds that burst forth and you can drink the juice. I mean, like how, how great of an image is that? And their whole, their whole mindset has been, been shifted. That inversion of truth for them by the enchantress has been reverted back. They go back to where they're supposed to be. Well, and we should, we can't avoid, uh, the, the, this, I think probably the climactic moment of the book is when Puddle Glum, you know, after right, right, the, the right. spell's been cast, right. right? And they're like questioning, you know, is is there really a sun? That's and right. Is right. This, is the, then, it's then, all a dream. It's right. all a dream that we dreamed up in Narnia. Narnia is not really true. The only yeah. thing that's true is here in this cave. Then Puddle Glum says, you know, if Narnia is just a dream, then by golly, that's the dream I'm going to live by. I'm yeah. going to live, even if, I don't know if it's true, but if there's, it, it, but if that, but it feels more true than anything else I'm experiencing. That's down right. Here. Even though this is what I'm touching, that feels more true. Yeah. And I choose to believe that even though I may not have the power, I may not be equipped right now to rationalize or, lo or logically deduct uh, that that is the case. I, I think that talks a, a little bit about the, the sort of seductive nature of, of the, the really true of, of, of this, this right. transcendental idea of, of the true, the good and the beautiful. 
um, there's something that is that draws you to that, um, and that it can pierce those transcendentals can pierce through that's right uh, the cloud of um, disinformation. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. Uh, that you that we see around us, right? Uh, if at first we're tempted to believe um, that only the strong will inherit the earth a greater point about the meek inheriting the earth. Right. I mean, there's something more that we feel most to be true. That's right. Um, and that's a power, a power, a strength that only something that is truly transcendental yeah. um, can, can I, wield in the, in our lives. There, there's a line that they keep using throughout. And I think Lewis uses it um, in many more ways than just one. Whenever they kind of, uh, question whether they should even uh, save Prince Rillian from the chair in his, in his madness, quote unquote madness. Um, they come to the realization that Aslan didn't tell them what would happen if they follow the signs. They have right. to follow, they have to follow the sign no matter what, but, but even so there are no accidents with right. Aslan, right. That, that everything with Aslan is true and good. There's nothing that is just accidental to the truth. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that's, just wishy-washy with him. And I think that goes and I think that, what you you're know, saying. I, that's a good point. And I have marked that several times in my book too. And I think Podoglum was the perfect character to point out yeah. like, well, this may be certain death, but that's we, right. we're, we're supposed to do it. And so, you know, just the fact that it's, it, there's no, there's no promise of, you know, all of the happy things that you expect. That's it's, right. it's, it's just what you're supposed to do. Mm, yeah. And Puddle Glum points that out at every step in the journey. It's like, this is what we have yeah. to do and who knows what's going to happen, but we have to do it. That's right. And yeah. so I think that his personality in that is yeah. really interesting because yeah. it's just a reality. I mean, he, in all of this murky confusion about what is reality in the silver chair, Puddle Glum is real, mm, consistently right. real. He is just like sort of the true North in terms of, pointing to what is objective and real. The burning of That's his right. flesh. Right. His real flesh, the real burning scatters all the enchantment of the smoke mm -hmm. of yeah. the enchantress. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I mean, yeah, what's also, I mean, to this point, uh, Puddle Glum uh, is sort of like a, I, I think Lewis is trying to highlight this like critical nature, this, you know, so if we, we might describe it as pessimism, but there's yeah. something to this, Reality. like this, Realism. this, yeah. this <laughs> yeah. like uh, I'm, I'm questioning what is true and you may call that pessimism or me being a you know, negative Nancy, but I, I'm trying to get to the bottom of this. Yeah. You know, there's something that that sort of spirit is something that is something very helpful. clear eyed about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Well, and you know, not, not to belabor this point, but I, there's a beautiful line after all of this is taken care of, they come back up and they're saved by the Narnians. It's there that Lewis says that everything in underworld seems now like a dream. The, 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 the transcendental has come back. The real thing has come back. No. So Mitch, a few minutes ago, you made the point that the truth that Puddle Glum sees when they're all in the en enchanted is even if, if not real, it feels real. You know, even mm -hmm. if he can't prove it, it feels right. Are you referencing Kierkegaard in that? <laughs> what's, what's the connection here? In, in book discussion, you, you went after Kierkegaard there for a minute. Yeah. Cause well, yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, what's helpful about uh, this, that sort of revelation is because, or is that it is very reminiscent of Kierkegaard's leap of faith, mm -hmm. right? So in his book, Fear and Trembling, he talks about Abraham as this, uh, um, the model of what faith is. Um, and the point that he's getting at is that there are things about what's about life that we can't rationalize or prove. We can't deduct logically. They involve a, a choice to, to jump after. Specifically, right? he, he's talking about the chapter 22, Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac. Yeah, yeah right? that's right. That's right. Um, and it goes back, to, it, it it actually goes back to, to Pascal, right? So Pascal's logical uh, argument that, you know, if, if you're going to believe that God is real or he's not, you might as well just believe that he's real because, you know, the wager is so great if you're wrong. Right. And a lot of people I've written about, a lot of people I've tried to critique Pascal. It's like, ah, this is a, not a really a logical argument. It doesn't make any sense. But they missed the existential point. You only have one life to live. So you only have one life to wager for mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And you, and therefore you have to ask the question, what are you going to wager your life on? Mm -hmm. There are things about being an atheist that I will never understand. 
because I'm not living that life. And there are things about Christianity that um, you can only understand when you wager your life for that thing. And so Kierkegaard picks up that existential limitation that is brought to light by Pascal. And he says, um, there is something about the religious form of life that is greater than an ethical form of life or um, the aesthetic form of life that's just sort of lived in, in terms of pleasure. And by making that sort of leap of faith, by jumping into that, then it, you experience so much more than, yeah. than, than what you would have if you had just stayed in this sort of pursuit of pleasure or even an ethical life, but that wasn't tied to a religious stage of life. Right? And, so, and that's what Puddle Glum does, right? right? He says, he says um, you know, I may not be able to prove that Narnia is there, but there's something more real and true about this. About living like a Narnian. That's about right. Living like a Narnian. Right. That's right. And so that's the Kierkegaardian leap of faith. Yeah. I think we see a picture of that at the very beginning when Jill is meeting Aslan. To go back to that scene where there's the, the stream and she's thirsty and she wants it. She has to submit to the fact that Aslan's there and take him with the water mm -hmm. in order to experience him and know him after. Mm -hmm. And then she finds out that the experience of Aslan, the knowledge of Aslan is better. Yeah. That is better than everything else that she had before her belief. Yeah. Yeah. So Ian, back on that point of the inversion coming from the Mount down into the underworld, it seems like various characters have their place yeah. on the way down. You and Lee were talking about this before we sat down. What's the significance of that insight, especially as it relates to classical education or, you know, truth more broadly? Sure. You know, I think I'll, I'll, I'll certainly allow you guys to fill in this conversation, especially in, in terms of classical education. Um, but one of the things that I see in this, this transition from the highest planes to the lowest planes is that everyone fits in a certain area, in a certain place. Um, and what we discover is that the underworld itself is kind of in this, this nowhere zone in this nowhere place where you have the Mount of Aslan where Aslan reigns and where there's this beautiful garden, everything there fits. You get into Narnia and the Narnians live there. Everything fits. Then you get into the underworld and you've got a bunch of people who don't fit mm. in the underworld. It's enchanted. It doesn't make sense. It's a liminal spot, but then in the defeat of underworld, the defeat of underworld, the chasm opens up, the very waters come in and, and start to flood the place, but the gnomes descend into Bism, into their place. And they try to get really in and they try to get Eustace and everybody to come down with them. And there's just this great sense of adventure that really feels just like Reaper Cheap. And Eustace brings up Reaper Cheap and says, you know, if Reaper Cheap were here, it would be, we would have to do this. He would remind us that it is upon our honor to do this. But then Puddle Glum, as always, reminds them, no, I think your father, your, your your probably dying father would rather that you come. And I think what Lewis is saying there is that creatures have their place. And, and, and the best way to explain this is that the animals are lower than, than men, than mankind, mm. that, that mankind is sort of the king of creation and has stewardship and authority over creation in this way. These gnomes, they don't fit in underworld. They don't necessarily fit in overland either, but they do fit in Bism. That's their place. And they have glories of their own there that even the overworlders won't necessarily be able to experience. Mm -hmm. One of the themes that <clears throat> we see in a lot of this literature, I mean, it's in Princess and the Goblin and then in Narnia and then also in Lord of the Rings is this inversion of, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, when, when, man for instance is is weak yeah then the animals rise and you know we can kind of see that you know mm -hmm. when when um you know when uh the higher form is not you know protecting their place or That's right. or where they belong then the lower form sort of ascends and i you know i, I it makes me think of kind of technology now you know like mm -hmm. if, if man's not protecting reality then you know, or if you know if, if humans aren't protecting reality then we're at risk of technology, you know, sort of Defining usurping and, yeah. what right. is reality, you know? And That's so right. you can kind of, and I think that was an idea of, of these authors. And you can see that in a lot of this literature, that that is, um, I guess, a threat that they are sort mm -hmm. of warning us about repetitively. In, in it's interesting you say threat because after they learn this lesson, right, then they go back to the experiment school and uh, 
and they sort of have to put their house in order. That's right. right. They this is very reminiscent of the hobbits whenever they at the end of the Return of the King when they get back to the scouring of the shrine. Yeah, when they right. get back to the, they have to they have to take the lessons that they've learned and they have to remake their home. That's right. Um, th- so that it is rightly ordered. Right. Order. Right. I mean, it's 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 just this idea of order that there is an order to things, and so when the order is disrupted, mm-hmm. you know. Sort of chaos ensues in all in all variety of ways, which requires the classical virtue of justice, right? To give each thing its due. That's right, you know, and no more, right? That's what justice is: is to give each thing, person, idea, value, um, its proper um, uh, its proper value, right? Um, and the right esteem. Um, and then in many ways, I mean, that's the mission of classical education: to teach yes. virtue and wisdom, the ability to to do right by assessing what is right and in its proper order. Yeah. Oh. Well, have we left anything on the table? Is there anything else that needs to be said about the silver chair at this table? I mean, you, we could talk about it forever. Yeah. But is there, is there anything else that needs to be said? I've enjoyed this conversation with you. It's really fun. We'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Classical Etc. If you enjoyed this conversation, please consider liking this video. If you want to join the conversation, then you can comment below. And if you want to stay connected, please subscribe to our channel. I hope you enjoyed this show and we'll see you next time.